Hi guys, okay, let's start off with cardiovascular. We're gonna do blood first. So this is the components of blood. Blood is um, divided into two parts. You have plasma and you have the formed elements. Plasma um, is primarily your liquid. It has some proteins and other solutes in it. But formed elements, how do we remember what the three formed elements are? Here is a quick trick. So I like to think of it as power, P, W, R, platelets, white blood cells, red blood cells. Platelets are also known as thrombocytes. White blood cells are also known as leukocytes. Cytes just mean cells, leuco meaning white, thrombo referring to platelets, and site referring to cells. Red blood cells, erythrocytes. A lot of this is just simple terminology to review. So site means cell, site, site means cell. Thrombo referring to platelets, leuco referring to white, erythrocytes referring to red. So these are your three formed elements of the blood and they make up about 50%. So a really easy way to remember it is 50-50. Plasma, which is your fluid, your plasma proteins and other solutes, that's about 50%. And your formed elements, power, that's about 50% as well. So like I said, power, platelets, white blood cells, red blood cells. Blood, um, platelets are associated with clotting. And clotting is, if you get a cut, it um, you don't bleed to death because your platelets, platelets will come in and They'll kind of pile on top of each other like plates to stop fluid loss or blood loss. White blood cells will cover that. That's a fun one to cover. So let's do white blood cells and then afterwards we'll do red. White blood cells. How do we remember the five white blood cells that we have? Well, first off, the most abundant cell in the blood are your red blood cells. After that, we have the white blood cells. So white blood cells most abundant is actually a neutrophil. How I remember it is this, um, I'm part Chinese, so I get a chance to do this. What is the most abundant ethnicity in the world? It's the Chinese, right? So the Chinese are there first. They're everywhere. So who is the most abundant white blood cell in the body? The Chinese. Now, nah. so here's the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat Bananas, 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. Never let monkeys eat bananas. 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. Never let monkeys eat bananas. 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. What is the most abundant white blood cell in the body? No, not the Chinese. It's the neutrophil. So the neutrophil is everywhere. It's there first. It's the most abundant. It accounts for 60% of all white blood cells. Well, there's a lot of neutrophils, but they're not big guys, so they, they have to call on their friends anytime that there's an infection. If the infection is too big for them to deal with, what they do is they call their friend chemo. And they have their friend chemo get in the taxi. So they called him with this thing called a cytokine. Cytokines are um, chemicals that are released in order to call other white blood cells um, to an area for aid. So they release cytokines and they called their friend who? Chemo. And how did chemo get there? Ta by taxi. So chemotaxis is the action of white blood cells moving to a target area because of or due to a cytokine that's released, which is the chemical that's released to call them back. So I said neutrophils. Uh, who is chemo? Chemo's a big eater. He's a really big guy. So your monocytes. Or account for about 6% of your overall white blood cell count. And monocytes become your big eater. So macro means big. Phage means eat. So literally, macrophages are big eaters. And how do they destroy whatever foreign substance is in your body? Well, they eat it. That's why they're a big eater. Um, after that, we have eosinophils. Eosinophils are white blood cells that account for 3% of the overall number. And what they are associated with, I'm underlining E for a reason, they're associated with allergies. 
and parasites. So there's ease and parasites and allergies. Eosinophils are associated with what? Allergies and parasites. And your last one, we're going to get to this next. Your last one on this list is basophils. They account for 1% of the overall white blood cell count. Basophils are similar to what we call mast cells. And both basophils and mast cells release histamine. Histamine is associated with allergic reaction. It increases the permeability of a, um, of a blood vessel to increase the amount of white blood cells that actually can migrate out into the tissue to help with the infection. Last one. If you forget this, you will be beaten limp. Ha ha ha, funny. Uh, B cells, T cells, and matricular cells are part of your lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. So again, B cells, T cells, natricular cells are examples of lymphocytes. What is the most abundant white blood cell in the, in the blood? Neutrophils. Good. They're there first. They're everywhere. They're the most abundant. They release cytokines, which are chemicals, to cause chemotaxis of other cells. What is a big eater cell that comes to their aid? A macrophage. Where does a macrophage come from? It comes from monocytes. Monocytes account for 6%. So these numbers here, never let monkeys eat bananas, 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. They represent ranges. When you're in the hospital and you have to look at a chart, um, a lot of times they'll have ranges for you. This is a good way to remember just an estimate for yourself. And then when you get to whatever hospital you're going to work at, you will know specifics on the numbers that they want you to reference. So again, let's erase this and test you on it really quickly. Never let monkeys eat bananas. 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. Who is the most abundant white blood cell in the blood? Neutrophils. Who is the most abundant cell in the blood? Red blood cells or erythrocytes. Good. How do neutrophils call their friends to help them? They release cytokines. And what do cytokines do? They cause chemotaxis of the other white blood cell. And who is a big eater? Macrophages. And where do they originate from? They come from monocytes. Monocytes circulate in the blood until they're called. And then once they're called, they can migrate into the tissue and differentiate into your macrophage. Who is associated with allergic reactions and parasites? Eosinophils, and who is similar to a mast cell releases histamine, basophils. And then if you forget this, you will be beaten limp. BT and natural killer cells are associated with lymphocytes. Very good. Let's move on. Next is going to be your red blood cell. So hemopoiesis just means blood, hemo, poi, creation, and then cis is just a condition of so hemopoiesis is the condition of creating blood. So in this case, what are the three formed elements? Power. What is power? Platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. Very good. Characteristics of blood. About five liters will circu circulate for the um, average person. Composition. Let's get to plasma proteins, which is the most important one that I want you to memorize. Albumins. Why? What do they do? They hold the fluid inside of the blood vessel. So if I'm not able to make albumin, let's say I'm in a country where there's not access to, there's no access to proteins like cows or meat, and I don't eat enough pro protein, I can't make the protein from the liver. So now I cannot hold the blood or fluid inside of the blood vessel. It leaks out into the tissue and it causes swelling, what is also known as edema. Fibrinogen is associated with um, clotting and clot formation. So albumins, most important one. Here we go, definition, hematocrit deals with red blood cell count. So what is hematocrit? Here's how to remember it and how to think of it. What is the most abundant cell in the blood? It's a red blood cell. What is the function of a red blood cell? It carries oxygen to tissues that are in need of it. So hematocrit is just um, a percentage. It tells you what percentage of the blood has your red blood cell. So it's a red blood cell count, and it depends on the number of red blood cells you have over basically all of your blood. So red blood cells plus plasma volume gives you a fraction, and you just times it by 100% to get your hematocrit percent. 
So males and females are a little bit different. Females, males, and then we'll talk about something called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is found in a red blood cell and it is the actual carrier transporter of oxygen. Females versus males for hematocrit. Let's say it's about 45% for females and maybe 50%. So there's, there's ranges. I think we'll, we'll cover that when we get to the next slide. But right now, let's understand the concept of what's going on. Red blood cells can be increased by either releasing a hormone called EPO, having an abundance of testosterone, injecting steroids into your blood. Steroids are similar to testosterone. These guys are similar. So if you have more testosterone, you have more steroids, you're going to make more red blood cells. So who's going to have a higher amount of hematocrit or higher amount of red blood cell count? The male will because he has a higher amount of testosterone. There's other ways that you can increase red blood cells. If you go to high altitude, um, let's say that you move to a mountain area and it's high altitude, what happens is you have a deficiency in oxygen and the body responds to that deficiency by releasing EPO. EPO will then increase red blood cell count to counter the deficiency in oxygen so that I can maintain transport of oxygen to the tissues. Um, there's something called 2,3-BPG, and that's also associated with lack of oxygen, or in this case, we're using high altitude. 2,3-BIS phosphoglycerate, also known as 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, is just associated with an increase or a deficiency in oxygen, and therefore increase in EPO and an increase in red blood cell count. So let's take a look at what the differences are between male and female. Males, they're saying an estimate of about 40 to 55. Females about, let's say 35 to 45 or 50. So it's a range, like anything else, anytime you see a range, it can change depending on the hospital that you are working for. So 35 to 45, 40 to 50, it's really only like a five to 10% difference between male and female. Um, of course, if a female was to increase testosterone levels by injecting steroids, she would probably have a, a greater red blood cell count. And what is that used for? Well, if you're an athlete, you want to be efficient with the oxygen that you're transporting to the tissues because the tissues are working hard. They need more oxygen to make more energy or ATP. So that's the reason why red blood cell count can have a great effect on you as well. Um, let's move on. What is the most abundant cell in the blood? Red blood cell. What is the most abundant white blood cell in the blood? Neutrophils. Very good. And how do they call their friends? They release cytokines. And how do cytokines call their friends? By chemotaxis. Okay, moving on. Um, the shape of a red blood cell has a big effect on whether or not it can be transported through this tube called a capillary. Let's take a look at what it is and why the shape of a red blood cell is so important. So if a red blood cell was simply a circle or a sphere and it needed to transport through a small tiny tube, how would this large circle get through a tube that is only so wide? It can't. Once it hits this area, it'll get stuck. So how does the body create a red blood cell that can be transported through a tiny tube in order to provide oxygen and nutrients to the supporting tissues? It creates something called a biconcave shape. It's almost like looking at a flexible Frisbee. The flexible Frisbee, right, can change its shape. Even though it's circular, it's semi-flat, almost like a disc, and as you push it through something like this tiny tube called a capillary, it can flex and be pushed through. What happens when you have a couple of red blood cells in a row is that they will line up, and like flexible frisbees, if you stack them one on each other, if it's flexible, you can squeeze it and push all of them together. They call that a Rolo. How I remember it is there is a chocolate 
uh, a caramel covered chocolate candy that is called Rolos. And it has this similar shape and it's stacking one on top of the other. So take a look at this image. These are your Rolos and they stack one on top of each other. They're flexible and they can fit through the capillaries in order to get to the tissues and then back through um, the other blood vessels. What is the most abundant cell in the blood? Red blood cell. Good. And what does it look like? It has a biconcave disc shape. And hemoglobin. What did I say hemoglobin was? It is the actual globin or protein that carries and transports the oxygen. Good. So what is the difference between male and female? We said females were a little bit lower than males. And what was some of the reasons? Testosterone. This is something that you may or may not use in the hospital if you're going into medicine. Hemoglobin over hematocrit. So males and females, there's a difference in number. Let's say that females are 12 to 15. This is an estimate. Just remember that. And let's say that males are about 14 to 16. In order to figure out what the hematocrit is, what does hematocrit mean again? It means the percentage of red blood cells that you have in the body. And what is that determined? The more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can transport to the tissue, the longer you can last in, say, a sporting event. So if you're running a marathon and you have more oxygen being supplied to your tissues as you're working out, you're going to be able to last longer. So females versus males, times this by three, and you get the hematocrit count. So three by 12 is just 36. Three by 15 is 45. 3 by 14 is 42, and then 3 by that is like, what is that? Uh, ooh, 48, wait, not 48. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Math, sometimes it catches you. So it's about, about the same. They're similar. If a female was to inject steroids, like I said before, her hematocrit count would go up. That means that she would have an advantage over other players in her same league or in her same um, in her same sporting event. That's why they make it illegal because this is an advantage that you would have over somebody else. So hemoglobin structure, we don't need to know too much for, for my class and what I'm going to be testing you guys on. Just understand that it does carry and transport oxygen. And that's what the shape would look like. Um, so one thing that I want to talk about is, let's go back to the red blood cell passing through a capillary and look at what we just saw on the screen. And then this is the last topic for this little section. We'll take a little break and we'll come back. So if it has a Rolo effect, we have a smaller tube that you have to squeeze through. You're able to do this because the red blood cell is flexible. What happens if, like I said earlier, it was either just a circle or in this case, let's make it a sickle. So they call this a sickle shell. And what happens is the red blood cell collapses and it creates this sharp, rigid shape. If you cannot fit through a capillary, what are some problems that you might see with this patient that has called it sickle cell? It means the cell creates the sickling formation. Well, you're gonna have traffic back here. It means you're gonna have blood stuck in this area back here. Well, what's going to happen to feeding the tissues? Well, you can't bring in nutrients. You can't bring in oxygen. If you don't eat and you can't breathe, what happens to you? Well, you die. This is called necrosis. So necrosis is when tissue starts to die off. If I have sickling of the cells with sickle cell anemia, then I can have these problems where there's pain, Necrosis, tissues are dying because there's no oxygen and there's no nutrients being provided to whatever tissue or organ is being affected by these sickling cells. Well, originally sickle cell anemia was um, patients that had this were able to fight off malaria and the parasites associated with malaria. When a parasite that was injected into you by a mosquito entered into a red blood cell, People that had the sickling capability 
would survive because it would collapse on the parasite. Now the parasite could not regenerate and that's how there survived malaria. The problem with this is if there's no malaria around and you still have this sickly trait, you start to see, um, I guess, dysfunctions with injuring the tissue. But I digress, let's move on. So this one is your normal biconcave red blood cell. And this is a cell that is sickled. And so we take a look at this. So these are all the cells that if you had malaria, it would collapse on the parasite and not allow it to regenerate itself. So you would survive malaria. And like I said, we're going to take our break now.